Next up, representing Team 60s. Pam Sherman is an actor, writer, leadership consultant and recovering lawyer. Pam's column, The Suburban Outlaw, was published on the USA Today Network for 15 years. Please give it up for representing Team 60s, Pam. Literally a month ago, so I didn't know you were talking about me. <laughs> My husband likes to quote a friend who on the occasion of his wife's 60th birthday said, I never thought I'd be begging a 60-year-old woman for sex. <laughs> 40 years ago, 40 years ago, when I met my husband on a semester abroad, I'm pretty sure he never thought he, that would happen to him either. <laughs> then again, I never thought that I would be a 60-year-old woman who actually loves having sex with a 60-year-old man. <laughs> Especially given the not-so-promising start to my sex life in the summer of my freshman year of college. That summer, I had stayed at school to study musical theater in a program organized by my voice teacher, who had played and starred in the original production of Guys and Dolls as the Virginal Sarah. At this stage, she was no virgin. She was a contemporary of Elaine Stritch and looked and sounded just like her. Now, she encouraged me to stay because she knew I couldn't sing, but she said I would learn how to sell a song. She didn't know that I wanted to stay for other reasons. My crush. You see, that summer, I was an 18-year-old virgin. Not virginal, no, not at all. I had lots of sex with all my crushes in my mind. <laughs> Which was strange because I was the youngest daughter of a gynecologist's father and a Freudian psychoanalyst mother. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I was so naive and confused about sex, but they were so baffling if I had a headache my father would say, take two aspirin, Pamela. Yes, of course. And my mother would say, who are you mad at? <laughs> Instead of talking to my mother about anything that was happening to my body during puberty, she would say, go ask your father. No, really, really. I worked in his office from the time I was 14 years old, and I saw the consequences of sex up close. Between all the blood, the urine samples, and the Weight Watcher weigh-ins from hell for the pregnant women, to me it wasn't pretty. I remember when I got my first period, it was my dad who threw a book into my room and all the paraphernalia. <laughs> yes, and he said to me these words of wisdom, it begins, Pamela. <laughs> had a love affair that was epic. He was always sweeping her off her feet to something romantic. But actual sex didn't seem to play into the equation for my role models. Now, of course, there was the locked room on Sunday mornings, and every time they had a bet, someone would have to pay with the usual. Yes. <laughs> no, really, it was hard to believe I was raised by them, and I could still be so slightly prudish, and very confused about sex. But I was determined to change all that that summer. Now, most of the men in the musical theater program, well, they were very gorgeous and very gay. Not my crush, or so he said. So we had many drunken nights that were spent dancing in sweaty packs at the great disco bars in Washington, DC. This was 1980. And all summer long, I had very satisfying, not quite sex on the dance floor with my gay dancer friends. And lots of bumping and grinding and being thrown in the air like a rag doll. <laughs> oh really, I should have just stopped right there, called that a sexual awakening and that would be fine. <laughs> but one night, my crush picked me to dance alone with him, yes. Yes, it was my dirty dancing moment. Just call me baby. <laughs> but you know, he was actually just an okay dancer. Not good as the others at all. That should have been a clue. 
because when I finally had sex with him, my crush was truly terrible in bed. <laughs> now, this was not my fantasy of hot, steamy summer sex. You could say my sexual awakening was crushed by my crush. It wasn't until a few summers later that I was finally able to understand the difference of what happens when sex is actually really good in real life and not just in my mind. With a partner who knows what they want, knows what they're doing, and when you do too. I flew to London for that semester abroad. In my still active fantasy mind, I would see a lot of theater and meet a cute Brit with a cool accent who would wipe away the memory of my crushed crush. I joked to my girlfriends that I had fantasies of just dating a British accent. Not an actual man, no, just an accent. Instead, at the group's first tea, I sat next to a burly, bearded guy wearing overalls with a do-rag bandana. Sherm was his nickname, and he was not my type at all. And this dude, wearing an Allman Brothers t-shirt, when we started to do the icebreaker exercises, didn't like anything I liked. Theater, museums, culture of any kind. And worse, he was from Geneva, New York, not Switzerland. <laughs> but then, his knee touched mine. He leaned over real close, and he locked his big baby blue eyes on mine, and I lost my breath. There was a tear in the universe. No, really, something electric happened, and I finally understood the concept of kismet, fate, love at first sight. It was either that or the jet lag, <laughs> but something stuck. And over the next few weeks, we started talking about life and love. And on our first real date, we danced at a disco called Manhattan Lights. <laughs> we walked in the rain, and we kissed under a lamppost. And yes, he was a really good dancer. <laughs> and then finally, we found a hotel room in Brighton by the Sea, and it was in that room that I finally became a sexual being, a real life one, not just in my mind. So after that, we traveled all over Europe together, Amsterdam, Dublin, Paris, sleeping and having sex in lots of crappy beds and breakfasts, and we didn't care as long as there was a bed and a door. When we ran out of condoms in Paris, I went to the pharmacy agency, right? <laughs> Avez-vous les condoms? I asked in my terrible French accent. Oui, grande ou petite? The woman at the counter responded. So I looked back towards the window where my guy was standing. He waved sweetly. I look at her, I look at him. I'm trying to figure out what size to get him. Medium? At that, she burst out laughing and slowly pulls out two boxes of condoms, one big and one small. <laughs> so my guy, who trained as a magician, said, well, this proves the adage, it's not the size of the wand that matters, <laughs> but the magic it creates. <laughs> so now I get why my parents emphasize the romance part of their relationship and not the actual act of sex. Perhaps it was their way of showing that head, heart, and body are all connected to make a great sex life. And here we are, celebrating the 40th year of our first date. <laughs> On September 21st, <laughs> loving life, each other, the family we created together, and yes, still sex. Because with all the distractions of life, when we are together, I am most truly, fully present in the moment. Sherm, we call each other that now, still excites me like that first time I sat next to him when he isn't pissing me off. 
He envelops me. I feel beautiful with him and loved for who I am. In the end, the key to great sex in a long-lived ma marriage is this, another old adage, practice makes perfect. So I hope 40 years from now, we'll still be practicing, and I'll be begging a 100-year-old man for sex. Yeah.